That's right. We're back with more Bonehead Detectives on Discovery Kids. Cool. Let's get back on the Amber Trail. We found some amazing samples with Roy in the Dominican Republic. But what do mummified bugs in Amber have to do with dinosaurs? Luckily, there's a certain paleo sleuth who knows the answer to that one. If you want to understand Tyrannosaurus rex, you've got to understand bugs. If you want to understand Triceratops, you've got to understand bugs. Bugs spread disease, and disease is one of the biggest killers of big animals today. It was that way in the Jurassic and Cretaceous. If you were a bull T-Rex fighting and gnashing with your teeth and pulling prey apart, what may kill you is the bug biting your rump, giving you a virus. You've got to worry about bugs. Which means if you want to know how the dinosaurs went extinct, and I know you do, then bugs might be the answer. So that's why amber is so valuable to bonehead detectives. If you think about it, it's a kind of crystal ball. You can see all the way back to 20 million BC, and sometimes even further back. Scientists can learn different things from amber, depending on how old it is. So let's go back now, all the way to the golden age of amber. Here we have the magnificent and wacky bone of time. This is the Mesozoic era, otherwise known as the Dino Days. Most amber comes from way over here on the right, way after the dinosaurs died out. But that amber doesn't tell us anything about the dinosaurs. True, but more and more amber is being found over here in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. It's loaded with all sorts of cool dino era knickknacks. Like bugs and plants, and maybe even the biggest prize of all, DNA. And that's the stuff that gets Dr. Bob and all the other dino detectives so pumped up. And nobody is more pumped up than the people here. Welcome to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. This place is buzzing with paleo activity. Check out insect detective Dave Grimaldi. When it comes to ancient bugs, Dave is king of the hill. It never gets boring. I mean, it's, it's almost an obsession going through this material. Um, uh, the thrill never stops. And um, I've seen hundreds of thousands of pieces of Dominican amber. And when you find something new you've ever seen that you haven't ever seen before, it's still thrilling. No wonder Dave's so jacked. Amber hunter Roy has finally arrived with his bag of amber treasure. Uh, what'd you get, Roy? I think we got something special. Oh, excellent. And now things get really exciting from a bonehead point of view. Dave's going to inspect these pieces with his high-powered specs to see what they've got inside. Here's some more wildlife that got caught in the sap trap. Wow, they're so well-preserved. It almost looks like they're alive. Now check this out. A whole entire lizard. Actually, that looks more like a gecko to me. Okay, so it's a gecko. It's still awesome. And thanks to Dave's amber-piercing x-ray machine, we can even see inside the little fella. It looks like he put up a pretty big fight against the amber. But cool as a gecko is, Dave's main focus is on prehistoric bugs. For scientists like myself who are interested in the history, the evolution of life, insects are the natural thing to study. They're the most diverse organisms on Earth, the most abundant kind of animals on Earth. And they're also among the earliest land animals. In those terms, insects are evolutionarily probably the most successful life form on our planet. Over 400 million years ago, insects were already walking, flying, creeping, and crawling all over the Earth. Their story started before the dinosaurs even, but there's one big difference. The bugs are still around. What this is a, is a um, small piece of Dominican amber with an inclusion of a common stingless bee, um, proplobated Dominican in it. Let's, let's zoom in right here just to see what kind of detail we have. That's an electron microscope that Dave's using. It lets him get a super close look at the bee that's encased in the amber. On the screen, the bee looks 20,000 times bigger than it really is. And because of that, Dave can even see those tiny bits of pollen stuck to the bee's tail. That's important, because if something as small as pollen is preserved, then it might be possible to also get some of the bee's DNA. Technology has revealed a level of preservation that was unexpected. Uh, soft tissues, um, things like muscles and organs are intact in these things. Uh, they're, they're dried out, but it's beautifully embalmed. I mean, ancient Egyptian morticians would have been envious of this kind of embalming. Now check this out, a prehistoric tick. Now what do ticks do? I'll tell you what they do. They latch onto animals and drink their blood. 
So this guy's last meal might have been a T-Rex. But can they get blood from a stone? Is there any dinosaur DNA in the amber? Here's the story. DNA is the basic material in your cell that gives you your special characteristics. Every animal has its own DNA code, including this T-Rex. Now this is the fun part, making a living dinosaur from the DNA that they're trying to dig out of the amber. It's called cloning. To make a clone, you need some of the animal's DNA and an egg from the same kind of animal, or one that's a lot like it. Scientists have already cloned animals like sheep. That wasn't so hard, because there are plenty of live sheep around to get DNA and eggs from. But to make a clone of a dinosaur, you'd need some dino DNA and then an egg from a bird or crocodile to put it into. But nobody knows if it can really be done. That's what the scientists in this lab are trying to figure out. And I sure hope they figure it out soon. You know, I've always dreamed of having a pet raptor. But what's the rush? I'm not going to be young forever. Will the experts in the lab beat the clock? Will Sam get the raptor puppy he's always wanted? The answer's next. Next, more hard rock and mysteries.